Night City Wire yesterday was incredible, and so today I'm going to go over absolutely everything about it, from what we saw in the first episode and everything that was announced, to what we're going to see in the future, to a roundup of previews featuring character creation options, skills, life path summaries, mission structures, the open world, gameplay, and technical details from all around the web, as well as show 85 new screenshots and compare what we've seen so far with past demos to show you graphical upgrades. First up, let's go over what we saw. The first episode for Night City Wire opened up with the gig trailer, showing off Night City at night in the rain, as well as our introduction to the opening scenes of Cyberpunk 2077, depending on your life path, which we will get into shortly. I do also want to say that I will be doing an extensive analysis of this trailer this weekend, so definitely look out for that one. Now, this trailer was all in-game footage, and some if not all the scenes are utilizing RTX. This trailer also shows how we will inevitably get the chip for Deshaun before getting shot and betrayed by him, left to wake up in the scrapyard. This heist mission really does go wrong for Jackie and V. Now, the chip seems to be in possession of Arasaka, who are one of the heaviest hitters in Night City. The trailer was followed by a trailer deep dive with Paolo Sosko, a commentary on the new feature of Braindance, as well as an announcement for Cyberpunk Edgerunners, a Netflix series coming in 2022 from Studio Trigger, an acclaimed Japan-based animation company. I know very little about anime studios, but it does seem fans are incredibly pleased with this. Everything that they showcased here was also part of the prologue and the first few quests. There was also some exclusive Katana gameplay, I'm not sure if that was featured in the Night City Wire, but GameStar somehow managed to get extra footage and it looks decent from the 5 or so seconds we can see. Now with episode 1 completely out of the way, episode 2 will be coming in just a few weeks, as per Holly Bennett and the third one is to be determined. Now there are only 3 slots on the Cyberpunk site, so after that we may get marketing drops in other forms. Moving on we have our preview roundup. I've gone over more than a dozen of these written previews and distilled this down into the nitty gritty of customization, the 3 different life paths, the gameplay, the weapons, the cyberware, the open world, the mechanics, the technical elements, as well as the overall pros and cons that I could glean. Starting off on the tech side, yes Cyberpunk 2077 will utilize DLSS 2.0 which is essentially upscaling technology which will help you push higher frames at the same graphical fidelity. Considering how heavy this game must be based on lighting and the world, this is great news for those who want to play with RTX on and soften the FPS blow. Evidently many of the previews who mention RTX say this is one of the best implementations of it, even over standouts like Control and Metro Exodus. Next up we have the character creator attributes and skills. The character creator was mentioned at being visibly 3 times larger than what we saw in the deep dive with 252 individual options from nail length to nipple size to even odd and zany eyes with some previewers mentioning black and white hypnotic eyes and the option to not have nipples. There were reported 6 skin types, 35 hairstyles, 17 eyes, 8 eyebrows, 17 mouths, 17 jaws, 17 ears, 8 bits of cyberware or what's likely surface wiring, 9 types of scars, 9 types of tattoos, 11 piercings, 5 types of teeth with someone mentioning pink chompers, 8 types of eye makeup, 5 bits of lip makeup, 3 blemishes, 3 types of nipples, 5 types of body tats, 3 types of scars, 2 dick types, 1 vagina option, the option to not have anything at all, dick size options, and 5 types of pubic hair. One of the journalists did mention creating a character with a tic tac dong and radioactive green pubes. Absolutely fantastic stuff and you can completely randomize your character as well if you so choose. Attributes have stayed the same but their descriptions have become clearer on what they actually have influence on. Body improves raw physical power and your health and reduces bullet spread. Reflexes are responsible for coordination and speed and it also increases your crit chance and your attack speed. Intelligence reduces hacking difficulty and shortens program upload duration. Technical gives armor, the chance for harvestable loot, and technical aptitude. Cool improves self-control, stealth and speed, and increases crits. Now each attribute has 2-3 different perk trees, which each have 20-30 to 30 perks within them, making them absolutely massive. Perks had names like Annihilation and Street Brawler, and there were mentions of high-tiered perks being rocket launchers for arms, no bullet sway or recoil for 10 second sprees, 50% less shotgun recoil if you dismember someone, as well as a cyber deck memory regen perk. When it comes to classes, there is a reason that techie has yet to be shown and that's because CDPR decided the techie overlapped too much with the netrunner, so they have decided to get rid of it as an overall playstyle. The reasoning behind it was that the flathead was too similar to quick hacks that the netrunner can use. Now there are still techie perks, but the central class element of using the flathead has been seemingly removed. 
Moving on, let's jump into some of the life paths. This was one of the focal points of the demo with previewers being able to choose the Nomad Corpo or Street Kid life path. It's to be noted that these last around 40 minutes and each life path converges into the same main story which starts with the scav mission. Also there's apparently a cinematic montage that will show your progress throughout the years but it was really unclear if that takes place before the life path prologue or as a bridge to the main story. Now first up let's mention the street kid. The street kid story starts off with V fixing his broken nose at a place called El Coyote Coho in Haywood. The bartender Pepe has not paid a debt to a fixer named Kirk. Since he is your friend, you decide to contact the fixer, where he tells you that to pay off the debt, you have to steal a rare car from a prolific corporation. A man called Padre drops you off outside the corporation's building with an access key and you sneak into the facility to steal the vehicle. Jackie holds a weapon at you in a double cross for the car, but not before an alarm is triggered and the NCPD surround you. The corpo whose facility and car it is comes down and tells the NCPD with an air of authority to essentially off them and toss them in the ocean. You wake up in the gutter and that's how the Street Kids Life Path prologue ends. Next we have the Nomad. The Nomad origin story starts off with you tearing off a badge of a Nomad affiliation that's seemingly severed. You've had a hiccup with your vehicle so you're at a mechanic's place but he's pretty useless so you try to get the job done for yourself getting your vehicle back onto the road. You're ambushed by a sheriff who doesn't look too thrilled to see you and tells you to scram before something bad happens after V calls him a corpo shill. V's main mission is to meet up with Jackie to deliver contraband from the Badlands into the city and at first it appears they make it across the border, but sure enough they get apprehended by Arsaka as they catch on. It's assumed you get caught and this is more or less where the Nomad prologue ends and the world of Night City opens up to you where you can pursue the main quest. With the corporate path, this starts off with you as a fresh-faced mid-tier corporate looking to climb the ranks in Arsaka. Arthur Jenkins is your boss and tasks you with the job of taking out the opposition in Susan Abernathy who's stealing promotions within your network. He tells you to use underworld contacts to offer and gives you some eddies and sends you on your way. You get into an AV and land on a rooftop basketball court. You end up smashing three basketballers who are a little ticked off that you chose that specific spot to land. You end up meeting up with Jackie to formulate a plan but Abernathy busts in, strips you of everything you have and fires you which is again where the world opens up and you can start the main quest. Moving right along here let's talk about cyberware and the weapons. There are three types of cybernetics. Active requires activation or an input, trigger implants activate when your health drops, and passive ones operate in the background. There are 20 mod slots for cyberware and 11 overall body slots you can replace. You can have 3 slots for your weapons which are accessible via a wheel, and there are a fair share of new weapons with varying types of ammunition and mods to show off. Gunplay seemed better than we initially thought with great sound, feedback, and recoil. Out of the dozens of previews I read and watched, only one or two felt the gameplay was too rigid. Melee was compared to The Witcher 3 but in first person and this was met with some criticism of feeling clunky for some. Melee is a full melee system with light and heavy attacks, parries, blocks and dodges, all bound to a stamina bar. Hacking is an important playstyle and utilizes programs as well as cyberdeck memory as mana. Hacking slows down time and you can hack cars to drive them, fans to distract enemies and surveillance cameras to play more stealthily amongst a myriad of other options. Hacking and stealth seem to have a lukewarm reception for some but many people attributed this to better perks and skills being level gated. There just simply was not enough time to get to them and try them. Driving seemed to be one of the features that might need some more work. This topic had a pretty big split with some saying it felt great but a tad heavy and others mentioning that bombing around at high speeds just didn't feel great. However, vehicles are unique and handle differently. Car chase scenes in the promo also played out much slower in the demos and wasn't an overly well received point. You can destroy cars and hack into them like previously mentioned and they will self drive to your location. Braindance suffered from a similar fate and was mentioned to be clunky, tedious, and dragged on. You could enter a BD recording using a headset called a wreath, and there was a segment where you had to locate an item in a CEO's office, and again this didn't really seem to get anyone overly excited. To me personally from what I saw it looks like a 3 layered Witcher sense mechanic and was honestly my least favorite part of the Night City Wire, although I didn't feel like it was shown in the best circumstances as a store robbery seems pretty vanilla to me. Now when it comes to open world and design, this was unanimously the most well received and hyped up feature throughout the previews. Other than the minor nitpick of NPC density being a tad less, which may be due to the fact that it's night, most praised Night City's easily distinguishable districts, its vertical scale, its layout, and neon soaked ambiance. NPCs came in all shapes and sizes and reacted incredibly realistically to the world. There was a mention of a cop scaring the player and a man reacting in the background, leading to a full on sprint, to a man claiming the gospel on the evils of cybernetics, then having two female NPCs come next to him and start taking selfies like he's some sort of insane celebrity, to NPCs getting freaked out if you're in their personal bubble for too long. 
Finally, when it comes to previews, there were some more miscellaneous sections that I thought were interesting, so let's go over them. You can harm a cop and you will get a warrant for your arrest, similar to GTA's wanted system. This will trigger a notification for the NCPD to track you. You can definitely help cops as well if you like, and you can scan NPCs to see if they have warrants, kill them, and collect a bounty. You can hack the NCPD databases to find NPCs with bounties to kill. Apparently there were a lot of side events that were more obscure in nature. There was a fight tournament against twins who had merged their consciousness, as well as a section where you had to rush a man to the ripper dock because his augmented penis was malfunctioning and going just a little bit haywire. If you take the corpo path during the main intro mission, you can see the virus on the cred chip Meredith Stout gives you, and you can call her out in a dialogue option. In the intro mission, you can also free Brick, a former Maelstrom leader, which will have a ripple effect on the Maelstrom arm of that mission and in the story. When it comes to phones, you can video call people or text. Video calls have dialogue options, and you can send files via text to complete quests. There are hidden stashes and treasures in the world. Now, one random event was called the Cyber Psycho event. This led to a mini boss somewhere in the world who'd gone on a rampage, and you could address it lethally or non lethally. Opening up the map is a 3D model of Night City that you can rotate. The game does have a skip feature similar to The Witcher 3's Meditation. You can get shot in the face for not choosing a dialogue option quickly enough. You can interact with allegedly every NPC. And finally, the most important one, there's a poster for an adult movie called Nilfgaard, a play on Nilfgaard. Moving to our next section, let's go over some of the new screenshots and concept art. First up, we have the new renders. We have Dexter Deshaun, a fixer. Evelyn Parker who runs the Lizzie's Bar and is high up in the Moxie's gang. We have our buddy Jackie, we have brain dance expert and Moxie technician Judy Alvarez, we have Royce from the Maelstrom, and we have T-Bug the Netrunner. We also have all the life path options starting dress patterns for both male and female V. We have male and female V Corpo, male and female V Nomad, and male and female V Street Kid. The renders also feature Yorinobu Arasaka, son of Suburo Arasaka, who actually hates Arasaka and rebelled against the corporations in the Cyberpunk 2020 lore. His gang is known as the Steel Dragons and opposes Japantown's Tiger Claws, who are backed by Arasaka. His appearance in the renders may give some credence to the Steel Dragons returning from the source material. Next up, we have the Tiger Claws, who we were just talking about. They love the katanas, bikes, and bioluminescent tattoos. These guys are one of the more ruthless gangs in Night City. We also have a budget arms shotgun, and this seems to be in the territory of the Nomads. Next we have a dreary rainy night in Night City with a sign in the back that mentions stripper or scrapped synapse roasters. This potentially has something to do with brain dance or the net as it can be quite the stimulus overload. Moving on we have a monk with considerable scarring and cyberware. There was a segment of some of the gameplay shown off where you have to rescue a monk from the maelstrom because monks seem to be against cybernetics in this world and the maelstrom were forcing them to implant it. This monk has not fared well in this sense and seems to have some botched implantations or scarring from trying to remove them. Moving on, we have the character renders and styles of entropism, which embodies necessity over style. Now I just hope that Starbucks vendor in Night City spelled that girl's name right. The man to the right of her also kinda looks like Conor McGregor from a side profile. Let me know if you guys see it or you just think I'm crazy. We also have style over substance kitsch characters, which are my personal favorite so far. Neo kitsch characters of style and substance featuring Lizzy Wizzy, aka Grimes at the front. And the substance over style neo militarism characters representing the corpo life. Again, when it comes to likeness, the man on the right kinda looks like Chris Brown. Jumping to the next new image, we have the railgun which we saw from the 48 minute demo, facing down some maelstrom gangers in a staircase. This weapon seems to have additional mods attached to the top. We also see an ad in the left which we haven't seen before for implantation. The minimap sits on the top right, denoting that we're in combat, and we also have our text messages underneath it. Some sort of Arasaka software or cybernetic interface sits on our HUD. It says only high ranking officers can utilize this, so maybe we have our hands on some high tech gear. We also have an augmented woman on the streets of Night City, a man using some super high tech Google glasses in a bar, as well as a very moody rain sequence with some impressive RTX reflections. Judy Alvarez is also shown in the game with her Lucky 13 tattoo, and we also have this image of a Max Tac officer. These are the top tier elite of the NCPD responsible for stopping murderous cyber psychos. Moving on, we have this interesting looking corporate-esque character sliding into some DMs on his iPhone 29 pink edition, and a slightly more menacing Arasaka corporate who may be Arthur Jenkins. We have Evelyn Parker who shares a resemblance to Anne Hathaway in my opinion, as well as a chopper taking off in the Badlands. Back to the streets, we have a first person capture of the player unloading a thick shotgun into a more augmented NCPD officer outside the Lizzie's bar. Again, in a screenshot in the rain at night, we see a Maelstrommer with some fancy mirror shades. These mantis blades here have undergone a slight design change and we see that they can utilize some mods to create some sort of electric field or attack in combination with the blades. Moving on, we have the sheriff harassing you during the starting section of the Nomad Life Path, 
as well as a quite interesting image of two combat vets from the 6th Street Gang attacking. 6th Street is a gang of combat veterans from the Central and Southern America wars who claim they're a protective gang but also operate in quite dodgy ways. Definitely, definitely some amazing looking screenshots here. Now as you guys all know, concept art is typically my favorite thing to look at when we get a bunch of information and media at once, and these are absolutely stunning. Check out some of these images that really give you a sense of the scale of Night City and the diversity of each section. This open air mall has a really diverse color palette, and there's even a man wearing a Native American headdress and a spotted red hyena with an augmentation. Rancho Coronado seems to lay within the industrial area of the city as power plants and petrochem dams loom over the cookie cutter housing. We have some concept art out in the Badlands too in what appears to be the Aldecaldos camp. The Aldecaldos are a nomad faction that in the past relied on contract work and were originally from LA until the collapse of the United States. Speaking of nomads, we also have the most violent faction, the Wraiths of the Raff and Shiv. These outlaws will murder, kill, and steal from just about anybody. There's even art pieces that show the more upper echelon and wealthy elite areas like this casino. Finally, we have four screenshots utilizing RTX from Nvidia as well as a couple of hidden images during the Night City Wire countdown. Thank you guys so much for watching, I will leave you guys with some comparison shots between 2018's demo and the similar scenes from the Night City Wire event. And as my voice starts to go, as always, for anything and everything cyberpunk, join Neon Nation by subscribing to the Neon Arcade.